Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Awakening Utopia 2020 Global Conference, in which you will be immersed in the wisdom, expertise, and breakthrough inspiration from more than 25 radical leaders, change agents, and influencers. My name is Jocelyn Mercado, and I am your host and the co-producer of this event. So you are invited in this space to attend, to dive in deep, and to gain a profound understanding of the secrets, insights, and pathways that we can collectively create in order to embody utopia now. Prepare to be revolutionized and supported, body, mind, and soul. You will learn potent ways that you can participate in accelerating humanity's awakening and manifesting our true potential for a bright and vibrant future. Together we are awakening utopia. And today I am very honored and excited to be speaking with Cater Brown. Welcome, Cater. Thank you, Jocelyn. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you so much for being a part of this event. And let me just introduce you to everybody here. Cater is an internationally renowned ceremonialist and Cowrie Shell diviner, a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Cater has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his in-depth knowledge of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and ritual healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based ceremonial encampments and training programs. Cater is a member of an International Wilderness Guides Council, and he's known for his ability to blend many creative and expressive forms of depth psychology and therapy with more ancient methods of healing through vision quest ceremonies, sweat lodge ceremonies, rites of passage experiences, and personalized ceremonies and rituals in his work with individuals, couples, groups, and communities. Cater lives in the highlands of Western North Carolina in Asheville, and you can visit him at www.caterbrown.com or www.rightsofpassagecouncil.org to learn more. And Cater, our topic today for your interview is Awakening the Wild Heart and the Road Ahead. And so um, I guess could we begin by, by speaking about the initiatory time that we're in right now um, and and how we can how how the um, indigenous wisdom and, and and your training can advise us on how to move forward in these times today yes thank you Jocelyn it's uh, you know uh, in thinking about doing this interview with you over the past few days and and what's happening in the world I realize the listeners that are going to be watching this are going to be watching this three weeks or so from now. Mm -hmm. And so even this, uh, the title of this conversation, The Road Ahead and the Awakening the Wild Heart, that in the next three weeks, you would have walked already through a number of challenges and maybe have lost some loved ones or had some, uh, some things stirring and, and challenging you or your family. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge the road that you have walked between the time we have started this interview and the time you're actually listening to it. Um, my prayers uh, go out to you and your family in these challenging times. And, um, and so this, this concept of, a, of the road ahead and awakening the wild heart. And what, is, what does that mean? That's the bigger context. And I thought... Uh, given the times we're in, it reminded me of a story. And it was a story that I uh, learned from Melodoma Somme. Um, and it spoke to me when I, when I leaned into, you know, what's happening in the world with this virus. What are the, what are the questions that come up in my mind? Um, these, these are times we look for answers, but it also gives us a certain uh, perspective on the questions, which are really important to, uh, how we lean into those and how we live beyond this, this particular threat. Um, and he shared this story with me about a man that uh, was in the village and he was asleep one night in his, in his hut. And he woke up in the middle of the night and there sitting beside of him was death. And he got really scared and he jumped up and he started running. Um, and he ran to all of the places that he could 
get to to get far enough away. Maybe he ran to grocery stores and started buying up food or for some reason, toilet paper. <laughs> Maybe he just ran and ran and ran and ran. And he paused for a moment and he considered death and, it, and how close it seemed to be. And he figured, well, this isn't far enough and he got to, got to keep going, I got to keep running. And so he ran further and further, ran way into the night. So, so far he was exhausted and he fell over, fell asleep. And that feeling we sometimes get that jolts us awake in the middle of the night and he jolted awake and thought about death again. Um, and he got up and started running more and he ran all the way into the next day. Finally collapsed, fell asleep for good this time and, and woke up many hours later. And when he did, there was death sitting right there beside of him. And he looked at death, startled once again and death looking at him and death said, I came to see you way back at the first village to tell you I would meet you here. And the man had considered all that running he had been doing and how he had lived his life, you know, and there he was. So I think when I think about this virus, I think it challenges in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, certainly the immediate response of how do we take care of ourselves? How do we take care of our elders? Um, and, and how do we uh, stay connected to each other um, during these times of pulling back and isolating. Um, and yet, what is our relationship to death? And, and really our relationship, therefore, to life in this, in this way of, it is, as many spiritual traditions speak about keeping death close as an ally, uh, not out of some morbid sense, but in a way that informs how we live. So if we're if we take just the, the, the title of this, this conversation, The Road Ahead, you know, the road ahead is that eventually we are gonna be sitting in that village facing death. And that's, that's inevitable, however it shows up for us. So the question is, how do we walk this road together? Do we rock, walk it in fear? Do we walk it in scarcity? Uh, and begin to kind of pull in and, and uh, reach for uh, resources that create more and more scarcity? Um, or do we rock it with more compassion and understanding for each other? Um, and so those are, those are questions that I think of in this time around um, with this virus happening. You know, how, how have you walked this road in the last three weeks uh, from the time that Jocelyn and I had this conversation to when you and I are communicating, you know, through this recording. Um, and how do you want to walk it moving forward? Um, those are the questions that I ask. And the awakening the wild heart is a reference to a type of awareness. Um, we could say indigenous heart or wild heart or clear heart. Um, this way of, uh, as my teacher said to me one time, he said, you know, the three most important things are, and I said, um, no, because I knew this wasn't a, <laughs> wasn't gonna entertain an answer. Um, he said, the three most important things are pay attention. And then he stopped and, the, and then I understood in that moment, okay, the three most important things, pay attention. So what are we paying attention to in these times, you know? Um, are we paying attention to our own well-being, our health, um, how we take care of ourselves, and I say our children, our elders, those that are more vulnerable in our communities? Um, what are the things we're choosing to pay attention to, and, and uh, what are the emotions that are driving our attention? You know, is it fear? Are we running from some uh, uh, harbinger of, of death? as if somehow we could eventually outrun it? Um, or are we looking at it and saying, aha, you're here for a lot of people now. And uh, so how do we live with that awareness? You know, more again, more compassionately, more with presence, more with patience. Um, so these are my initial thoughts on these times that we're in. Yeah, thank you so much, Cater. <clears throat> and um, and I know that one thing you speak about 
frequently is the gatekeepers and and you know that when we want to break free from old patterns and old constructs there are these gatekeepers standing in our path so could you share more about that and and how do they help us yeah that's a, that's a, which is an interesting way to end the question how do these gatekeepers help us um if you think about coming to a threshold and so in the in the context of my world rites of passage initiations you have these these phases this severance phase this threshold phase and then this return phase and the severance phase is this period of where things are changing where things are ending things are falling away maybe um, intentionally that we're, we're changing or maybe unintentionally like we're being forced to in this time um, and yet we resist those changes um, we run into what I call the gatekeepers that stand in the way of us and, and the life that is uh, more uh, authentically ours to belong to and uh, and so these gatekeepers are made of all the old ways I call them old ways of loving Old, old ways of uh, understanding ourselves in relationship to others, old beliefs about uh, communication, old beliefs about relationships, whatever these old ways of loving, they, they come up and serve as a gatekeeper, almost uh, in the way of gatekeeper to challenge us. Are we really going to move beyond uh, these limiting beliefs and, and limiting paradigms of thinking? Um, and so they stir up in us. We, we could even say that this, uh, that this virus is a type of gatekeeper um, that has shown up in a way uh, to challenge us. And are we going to change our ways of living in relationship to each other, uh, to the environment, to the world around us? Um, or are we not? You know, there's, and, and it's interesting with, with gatekeepers, there's always a, an offering to be made at the gateway. You know, when you're crossing a threshold, you pause, you touch the ground, you offer gratitude. Um, and, and so uh, in this way, th this gatekeeper shows up and what are the offerings that are being made? And unfortunately, the, the lives that may be part of the, become part of that offering um, as we learn. You know, it's, it's interesting to say in, in China, they're starting to see blue skies for the first time and maybe ever and how that memory settle into their consciousness of uh you know will, will we go back to old patterns um and your uh the title of this uh, of this talk you know about utopia and um so think of gatekeepers as those experiences or those parts of ourselves what i call the internal gatekeepers or the external ones, the, the, the things or the, the people around us that would rather we didn't change because it's too comfortable. Um, those things come up to challenge us. And so if we think of utopia as not a destination or a place or uh, a, a situation, but as a way of living, um, it's, it's often the way I hear that people talk about community. It's like, well, don't think about community as a, as a thing that exists. Think about it as a way of living. Um, so it's more of a verb uh, than a descriptive of some, some way of some arrival, some place we get to or some destination. Um, so, this, uh, so this road to utopia speaks of a different way of living. And these changes that we're encouraged to take are going to, they're already causing us to look at aspects of ourselves that we've grown very comfortable with. And the thing about initiation, and if we look at this as a global initiation, like this virus is a global initiation wake up call. Um, the thing about initiation is it, it has little concerns for the comforts of the life we have created and it's mostly concerned with how we're going to move ahead um, and so we're forced to look at some of those uh, comforts of the life we've created and and can they really be sustained if we make these changes um, and so these gatekeepers meet us there at the threshold and say you say that you want to make these changes 
Um, and once you cross this threshold, that means you have to pick up new responsibilities. Um, in the old way of initiation, maybe you have to change your name and all of the context of what that means, not from a literal place, but to, to re-identify yourself or the way you belong to your community. Um, so these gatekeepers are there to ensure that, you know, if we, if we make that crossing, um, that the parts of us uh, that can't live on the other side, the old beliefs, the old attitudes, the old stories that we, that we tell ourselves about ourselves, which are often the most damaging, um, that they can't live on the other side of this threshold. So we pause at the gate. And we, you know, I always say there, there are certain gate, gate, uh, gateway rituals that maybe we'll talk about toward the end, but we pause at the gate and we examine the gatekeepers. And um, it's likely they have served us in some way, these old patterns. Um, and so we also want to be grateful, you know, because they have been there. Um, as, a, as a friend of mine many years ago, uh, we were sitting on the steps outside of this, uh, uh, outside of an old house where we were um, doing this, this group work. And, and we sat outside during the break and she lit up a cigarette. And she, uh, she was studying the cigarette. And she said, you know, I'm about ready to, to put you down. She was talking to it. Uh, but I am so glad that you were there when I needed you. Mm -hmm. And so there's grief in it. You know, we can't cross these gateways without acknowledging the grief either. Um, and I think that's a big part of what, uh, what Joanna Macy and, and many of the reason why grief rituals are resurging these days is, is this acknowledgement of change requires honoring and often honoring involves grief, uh, because there's gratitude in it. Um, grief and gratitude run together. So those are some thoughts on, on the gatekeepers that we, um, and everybody has their own, so it's kind of hard to identify what specifically mm -hmm. um, those might be for each person. Yeah, I think it's so so interesting to think of this virus, the coronavirus, as a gatekeeper for us, and how is how is this asking us to change? And as you said, the shutting down of the factories in China, and they can see blue sky for the first time, maybe in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And if you just think of all the flights that have been grounded and all the people who are staying home instead of driving their cars, it's very powerful from a, you know, just a fossil fuel perspective right. of how we're, this is, this is something that, that the earth has sent us that we cannot ignore mm -hmm. and, and look at the results that are happening in, in one way, you know, um, that, that it, it just seems we're being given this impetus to to evolve in a new direction. So it's very powerful. Yeah, I'll, I'll share a funny story. Right right before you and I connected here online, I was um, getting some mulch for my garden because now I have lots of time off too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so doing yard work. <laughs> and uh, I was talking with the lady um, uh, at the, the place to get mulch, and she said, yeah, my... My teenage daughter asks me uh, if she if anything needed cleaning around the house, and I thought, "Wow, there's there's something positive <laughs> happening." So, if the impact it has on teenagers is that they they say, "Hmm, how can I how can I help out?" It's like, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and I don't want to dismiss or, or make light of the 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 challenges of this virus, yeah. um, especially for our elderly or those with uh, compromised immune systems or respiratory systems. Um, but if we want to ask the questions, you know, what, what is the teaching here? Um, and uh, entertain um, even the idea, you know, I've, I've heard it, we've all heard it talked about that the way we have been living on the planet has become a virus mm -hmm. that has started to kill. So, and, and so, if we flip this idea of virus around, is is the Earth's response? Is it is it a um, you know a, an immune response uh, to a way of life that can't sustain itself? Mm -hmm. um, and that requires a 
um, to move outside our, our usual uh, egocentric way of thinking as humans and, and more to an ecocentric or a soul centric, um, as my friend Bill Plotkin like to, likes to say those words in reference to a, a different way of, of considering our, uh, our relationship to what's happening instead of a human centric. Um, so that would, that would uh, mean, you know, are, are the way, is the way in which we have been living uh, become viral and in, in, in what it's been destroying? And is the earth uh, in all of its mystery, uh, all, you know, offering certain responses to that? Um, it's, it's, you know, it's worth asking the question, even if it's not a comfortable question to ask. Um, because we can get so egocentrically focused that we're about saving everything and recycling everything. Um, but humans, we haven't been on the planet that long as a species and species come and go <laughs> on the planet. And so, you know, to, to consider that, you know, maybe, maybe us is something we need to consider. How are we living in relation to, uh, the, the web of life, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think these are all extremely important questions for us to really, really think deeply about and really think about how, what we might want to shift and change in our lives going forward. Um, I would say, you know, say something about that. Yeah, well, I would say that the shifting and changing, you know, um, this, if we just take the, the recommendation of social isolation. And so where's a great place to do that? Other than our homes, walk into a park, you know, walk around the lake, um, go into nature somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, begin to reconnect there. And this, this is, you know, when we talk about rites of passage, this idea of, severing from the old way of life and then stepping into this threshold period, which I think is what we're in now. Um, the threshold period of the, of, the, of the quest is where we're asked to reach out beyond our own resources, um, to reach out to something greater than ourselves, to, to more deeply listen uh, to what's, what's going on around us. So, if you find yourself with a lot of time, um, you know, start spending, go, going into nature if you can, if you live in such a place, um, and, and uh, sit in the silence and listen. You know, what is being asked of me during this time? Um, you know, find, find the question. Um, it's one of the dangers of things like this is they activate such urgency and, and can activate panic um, and where we're searching for answers. Um, but I think this is an opportune time to really find what are the questions uh, that I should be asking myself that will guide my life. Um, I think those, those are, that's what's going to help us when we come out of this um, or what questions we come up with, not what answers we have to solve it. That, that's necessary and important. But if we come out of this with some important questions that we ask ourselves uh, collectively and, and individually, um, that would be very important. Yes. And, and you've talked about the, this threshold phase. Um, and so do you believe that humanity and this is certainly bigger than just the virus right but do you believe that humanity is standing at a threshold point right now um i think that we have uh you know collectively we've entered the threshold and um to be standing at a threshold is, is to be examining the gatekeepers you know once we step across once we're in it when I say in it, you think of uh, in the Christian stories, I always like to say Jesus went down to the river and did a water ritual with a wild man named John, and he went into the threshold. He went into the desert. You know, Muhammad went up on the mountain. Buddha went under the Bodhi tree. You know, it, it's this going into the threshold. And I think 
um, which comes after the severance, after the disconnection. And so I think we have a real opportunity um, in this threshold phase um, to deeply listen, um, to not, uh, to be careful not simply to ride this out with how do we create enough distractions to get through it? Um, but what is our relationship to the silence? What is our, you know, do we like the company we keep when we're with ourselves? Um, you know, these are the things that, that drive our impulses or compulsions or obsessions. And so now we're kind of forced into this threshold period. Um, and I just really encourage people to, to, to take advantage of it. You know, it may bring your family closer together, you know, as, as people are coming home and staying. Um, it, it may give you an opportunity to, to spend some time in silence or in, in nature in isolation, just like a, you know, you know, Jesus in the desert or Buddha under the Bodhi tree to go and spend some deliberate time um, and see, see what it, this has to offer. Um, instead of something simply to, to ride out from a state of panic or fear or, um, or somehow to fill it up with enough distractions and entertainment that we can kind of get through it. Um, I think the days of, uh, of the status quo, I think those are definitely ending. Um, and this is like the first time, uh, I don't know if we've ever had this happen, that the world itself has all of a sudden been halted mm -hmm. and, um, and put on pause. Um, and I say, turn into it and pause and listen. Um, and there may be things that come up, those gatekeepers usually come up first um, in terms of maybe thought things you hadn't thought of, things that need to be reconciled within yourself or between you and others. Those are usually the first wave of gatekeepers that come in during the silence or solitude. Um, is this period of, of reconciliation that's uh, and healing that is encouraged. Um, so just noticing these things. Now I think I definitely think we've crossed the threshold uh, line, and now we're in this period. Uh, and think of threshold as a phase rather than like a door, like I'm looking at a door over there, you just step through it, right? And cross the threshold. Um, no, a threshold is, can be decades, it can be a few days. Um, it's not simply something we pass through quickly. Um, and so, and it's also the period where we're asked to reach out to something greater than ourselves to carry us through. So what are, uh, what are spiritual beliefs? What, what, is, what do I look to uh, that's greater than me? Uh, even if it's this mountain outside my window um, that I make offerings to, or even if it's, you know, I have a, or a spiritual belief system, it's like, what do we turn to in these places that, uh, that we might just simply refer to as the great mystery or a great spirit that's, um, that's there, you know? So those are things that, that we're asked of in the threshold and this, this deep surrender, um, surrendering uh, of old ways. Um, in order for a threshold to be complete, it requires a, a deep surrender or letting go. Um, think of the seasonally, you know, we've just come through winter and, um, and we're about to hit the spring equinox. So seasonally winter can exist so that we can surrender so completely that spring simply shows up because we let go enough. Um, and so what are those parts of myself that I need to re-examine and, and let go of so that I can be more loving toward my family, my friends, with my, even mostly with myself, you know, these questions. So yes, yeah, so I would definitely say we're in the threshold. <laughs> yes. And, you know, the, the title of this event in its entirety is Awakening Utopia. And um, I wonder what are your thoughts on, you know, the fact that we need to go through these initiatory experiences. We need to go through these experiences that take us beyond the limits of what we thought we could handle. Mm -hmm. 
right? In order to get to the next stage mm -hmm. of awakening or our evolution. So, um, yeah, I would just, I would love to hear your thoughts on that, on how, how we can best navigate, um, you know, the difficult, challenging times and looking at utopia, I, I love what you said, as not a destination that we're going to suddenly one day arrive at, but like utopia being the journey, utopia mm -hmm. being the decisions we make along the way that are in alignment with, with truth and life. Um, yeah, I guess it, it's, it's a long winded way to ask this question, but how, how can we best navigate, you know, these uncertain times, um, and, and help to cultivate the growth of, of utopia, the evolution into utopia, the world that we know is possible. Right. So it's, uh, it takes me back to the, not only the title of your talk, but the, the title of the our little discussion here, this, you know, this road ahead is really what it's about. There is, you say, there's no destination. Utopia is not a place or a neighborhood or a gated community. <laughs> um, it, it's a way of living. Um, and, and so we're, we're being forced to look at how we've been living. Um, so I would say the, the, how do we navigate it first? Um, take this period of, of um, imposed solitude for a lot of us, um, imposed isolation or solitude, and embrace it. Like, go there, um, light a candle, you know, and, and ask yourself some important questions. You know, ask, what is this virus forcing me to look at? Forcing, how is it? Uh, is it is it forcing family members to come together that may not be you know want to come together? Does it is it forcing me to to pay attention to the elders in my community? It's like it'll have a way that it kind of forces us to do something and encourage people not to resist that. To what is that? What is the teaching here for me personally? What is it? What is this this virus asking of me personally? Um, in how I'm living my life. And you might have, some might have to extract themselves from the fear-driven impulse of how I respond to it, um, or the scarcity-driven impulse of how I respond to it, um, to be able to get to what, it, what, is it being, what is being asked of me. Um, and I think that would require some stillness, some listening, some, again, whether it's one's practice to light a candle, uh, to, to go, to, you know, just to go into nature or to spend some time in meditation um, or just in, in a more active way, just look around, you know. Uh, if, you're at, if you're a mom and you're at home and you have kids at home, it's like, huh, here we are. And, and this is what's been uh, brought to us. Um, not how can I get through it. What is, what is the opportunity here um, that's being asked of me? Um, these are things I've noticed personally as I begin to, to experience the challenges. It, I notice that it's calling forth parts of me that uh, I've kept in either um, a subculture or a, um, kind of only in certain places, but it's like, oh, I have to bring that here, bring that here. Um, so I think that's, a, that's a, a more immediate question is, um, what is being asked of me that doesn't come from a place of scarcity um, or fear? And, um, and keep the answer close in. Uh, as, as some people, as great visionaries, can get way out, like, what do I do with my life? You know, it's a good question to ponder. No, what do I do today? What do I do now that my kids are at home from school? What do I do now that I can't go to work? Um, you know, I heard the places, I heard a story of, you know, folks in Italy when they've been, they've been forced into, you know, into isolation that they started to sing to each other from buildings as a way to connect. Oh, wow. Thought, wow, that's beautiful. So it's, okay. it's forcing us, uh, it's almost like this, this forced uh, isolation that, that we're having to go into 
is awakening the awareness of this desire to connect and to belong. Um, and so I really encourage people to look at this. And again, careful not to simply fill it with distractions of how many you know, Netflix you know, series we can watch. Or, um, but what is, what, is, what is really being asked of me in this time? And how can I respond to that today, this week? Um, I think that's, that's the important question. What actions can I take? Um, rather than what does it all mean? Because that'll change next week and certainly three weeks from now. Yes, and even tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, oh, that's so powerful, the story about the singing between buildings. And mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. It's, it really speaks to the desire of the, the, the human heart to, to connect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in a way it's, it's sad that what we call connection technologies often uh, just further our disconnection mm -hmm. from each other. Um, actually causes things to speed up, not really to shift. We just, we take these conveniences and we let them speed us up as opposed to actually free up our time to connect more deeply. Um, yeah, it's very interesting to think about this, you know, the social distancing mm -hmm. actually having a, a result of bringing us closer together because mm -hmm. it's making us realize what we, what we're missing. But it, it, it changes a habitual way of being in relationship with each other. It creates some intention and, um, and some consciousness around the simple act of shared space. Uh, and again, if we come not from a place of fear, um, you know, I imagine, and this would probably already happen, the kind of initial social awkwardness of like, oh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I can't really hug them and, or shake their hand. And, um, and I'm going to talk with them about six feet apart. And it's like, but it creates a, a real conscious intention about, about connection. Um, and it changes some old habits that we have. And anytime you can change a habit, um, more awareness and consciousness comes to the surface. It's like uh, habitual ways of, of thinking and feeling and behaving keep us asleep because you don't have to be really awake to do, do things out of habit. Mm -hmm. But uh, try putting on your... You know, if you if you wear pants, try putting on your pants by putting your opposite leg in first, and tell me that doesn't create an awareness. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm breaking a habit. I'm much more aware. Um, I used to do this little exercise. Maybe I can show you here. Little little thing to practice with. If you if you say, take your hands and clasp them together like that, and and then notice which thumb is on top. For me, it's the right one. And um, so what I would say is doing so, you notice which thumb is on top. And so my, my words to you is that every time you clasp your hands, every time I clasp my hands, my right thumb is on top, without a doubt. It's never the other way. Now, if I switch it, if I change and put my other thumb on top and move all the fingers down one, it feels a little awkward, doesn't it? <laughs> what you've done is you, you've just broken a habitual pattern of behavior. And so it creates kind of a, an awakening awareness, like I'm keenly aware of how my fingers are aligned. Um, where doing this, I'm really not. So anytime we can break a, a, hab, a habitual way of being, we wake up our awareness. So think about, you know, that's just one example, just the, you know, millions or billions of ways that we habitually think and feel and act that keeps us asleep. So I think this definitely this virus has woke is an opportunity to wake up, yes. um, and, and not just out of panic and what we're going to do about it, but from a bigger place. What are the habitual ways of connecting, you know, with each other that I have have done in my life, um, or what is my habitual way of being in relationship to solitude with myself, or have I avoided it? Um, so it just it, it does force us to break a lot of habits. It's like, you know, having somebody force your fingers to go the other way and all of a sudden it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, so I think this is, this is what's being asked of us to really examine uh, old, old habitual ways of living in relationship with ourselves and each other and, and, and the environment and uh, 
I mean, much bigger social systems and justice systems and yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, really, um, really powerful to think of this in terms of pattern breaking and how that could, how that could be helping us. Yeah. So if I left you, I'm not sure where we are with time, but if I did leave you with a question, um, I'll go back to that question. What is the, ch what are, what are the challenges of this virus? What are, what are the challenge of this virus asking of me? And how will I respond? You know, and again, if you notice the first ones being fear, or anxiety, or scarcity pop up, just notice them. If you can move beyond those and come back to uh, what are the challenges of this virus asking of me and my response to it? Um, and how will I live uh, this, this uh, way of utopia is that you're speaking about here? How I begin to live in that way? As my teacher used to say, live your life as a ceremony. Uh, that way you're never not in it. <laughs> you're always in ceremony. Just, which means pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Um, and it forces us to slow down. I think it's again, it's a, a forced slowing down and a, and a forced uh, paying attention opportunity we have here. Um, and then, you know, again, how do we care for our elders? How do we take care of and, and protect them and honor them and respect them? Um, and during these times of not just, oh, I'm a young person or I'm physically fit and I'm, you know, have a good strong immune system. Um, but if you have contact with somebody else that maybe not, then you, you know, it's like, oh, I'm responsible for them too. You know, so that's, it's a way of, it's interesting. It, it does bring us together in that way. It's like, I can't, if I'm responsible for an elderly person in my life, I just can't go, go places that I would normally go because I'll be fine. Yes. Um, it's time to, it's, this really is a time to think about the we, you know, the, the, the greater community and not just ourselves individually, which fear and scarcity tend to do that. One is to kind of think about ourselves. Um, yeah, that's one thing that has really stood out for me is this feeling of, of each of us having, no matter how, you know, no, no matter what age or health status, each of us has a responsibility mm -hmm. to stay in, mm -hmm. not be going out, socializing, going to the store as often as we normally would and all that, but having this responsibility to not spread mm -hmm. the virus. Mm -hmm. And that's just very basic. And, but as we, if we think of the elders in the community or those who are, struggling with health already, you know, we really, we can, we can really bring that into our heart, I think, and, and, you know, feel that at a very deep level, like this, this is one small, but very important responsibility that I have that I can really do every day. Right. right. It, it reminds me of that, that idea of, of the vision quest, you know, when you, when then, and you're in that rite of passage initiatory process, when you go up on the mountain, let's say when you go up on sacred mountain, you don't go there for yourself. You go there for your people. That's why you go up on the mountain. Uh, so it, it, in the words of the Old Testament prophet, so that your people may live. So this kind of is that, that going up there um, to, to find greater vision, greater awareness, greater connection to yourself is not simply for yourself, but so that you come back with more to offer. And, and so I do, uh, you know, hear this, this virus asking that of us, um, you know, statistically we can call it flattening the curve, but relationally it's like, Oh, we are responsible for all of our people. You know, we're not, we don't live in isolation, uh, yes. with the, you know, in our little homes. Well, Cater, I know we're getting close to the end of the interview time here, but I wonder if you could offer us a ritual prescription um, to take with us to, to help us move forward with the inspiration and the clarity of a wild heart. Um, if, um, if you have access uh, to nature, natural surrounding, a park or, or woods, or um, is to, to 
take a day of solitude. We have that opportunity um, to create a threshold that maybe, maybe you go to this place at the beginning as after sunrise, let somebody know where you're going and, um, and take your journal, take some water. And if, and if, if you can fast, okay, if you're not diabetic or have any issues with the eating, or if you do take some snacks, um, but then, uh, make a threshold line that you step into this walk or just a period of time in nature in solitude with your journal and, um, and ask the question, what is being asked of me during these times? Uh, and again, keep the, uh, let the answer be close in and, and be uh, clearly defined, not, not broad and uh, you know, lifetime encompassing um, and spend, you know, half a day or a day in nature, uh, just with the question. Um, and maybe you come back with more questions, um, which is even good. That's even better. Um, if you don't have access to nature, um, you know, and you can do this in your own home, um, if you have a spiritual tradition that you're aligned with, you know, maybe light a candle and, and invoke uh, the guidance and support of that of that belief system, um, and ask the question, you know, Creator, Great Spirit, what what is being asked of me during this time, in relation to my people? Um, because that's really uh, the bigger question, um, and I would expand that uh, to not just human people, but all peoples, uh, you know, human and non-human peoples on the planet that uh, we're in relationship with. Um, so the take up time of really taking advantage of this, what seems like forced solitude and go with it and step into it and be willing to notice and notice what comes up, uh, as you're there, maybe there's some discomforts, those gatekeepers and it might originally, you know, show up at first that, that cause some uncertainty or angst, but kind of sit through that or lean through that and eventually that'll pass. Um, and then, uh, and this, this is uh, um, another one. This would be more specific to people that could do this. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was doing a sweat lodge ceremony almost uh, regularly, uh, two, two, three times a month for a year or two or three years. Like I never got sick. Um, and I was reminded today in listening to something about this virus that this virus can't live in hot temperatures. Um, there's certain research that says under, I forget what it is, maybe 130 degrees Fahrenheit, 56 Celsius, um, that the virus collapses pretty quickly mm-hmm. within minutes and can't survive. Um, so maybe it's time to pour more sweat lodge ceremonies for those of you out there, those medicine carriers that do that. Um, might be a good thing to uh, take yourself in the ceremony and, and, or, or your family. And, and, you know, from a very practical to raise the heat and sustain it. Mm-hmm. And so that when we breathe in hot air for, I guess, five to 10 minutes of sustained heat um, that actually will help. Um, kind of reset the 14 day period at least <laughs> of incubation. Um, and then lastly, I would say, uh, be mindful of each other um, and that there are a lot of people that are frightened and vulnerable um, and ask yourself, what can I bring to this uh, at, at rather than contribute into it? Um, that would be an important question. So that's what I, that's what I leave everyone with. Wow. Thank you so much, Cater. This is really, um, very profound and and very helpful. And I, and I do recommend that that those who can get out into nature really set aside the time. It seems that time is important, right? Mm -hmm. And especially in that first part of the ritual that you described to really let the things process through as we're, Mm -hmm. as we're meditating and reflecting on them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope that, that many of you will go out and do that and, and bring back what you, what you discover, even if it is all questions. Mm-hmm. May there be questions that you can live into. Those are the, is, is Carl Gustav Jung or Joanna Macy, 
uh, more recently said that there's, there's one great question that runs like a thread through everyone's life. And you're very fortunate if you can find it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a question you immediately answer. It's one you live into. And maybe you spend your whole life living into this question. Um, and maybe it's a great enough question that it takes several generations uh, of your descendants to really live into it. You know, so there, there's something very important and potent about finding what is the one great question that runs through my life and how can I live into that as a reflection of uh, utopia? Yeah, thank you so much for this this wisdom that you've shared with us today, Cater. And I know that you have a, a, a wonderful free gift um, to share with everybody, which is a, an audio download of the drumming story, Singing Stone, mm -hmm. um, and also an entry for a, a free one hour private divination with you. So would you like to say a few more words about those those gifts? Yeah, the, the audio story of the... Uh, uh, story singing stone um, is available all you have to do is sign up for the newsletter and you'll get uh, the it'll download it'll come to you automatically you have you, you have the option to download it um, and then the uh, from all the people that sign up uh, during the the course of your summit to the newsletter and get the audio then I can track those numbers and from that list I'll randomly choose uh, someone um, to receive a, a cowrie shell divination. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, you can go to my website that was mentioned in the beginning of this, of this interview and uh, just click on um, cowrie shell divination and learn all about that. But it's done remotely like this. So um, you can be anywhere in the world. And so those are the, those are the gifts. Okay. Well, yes, I hope everybody will go and claim those gifts and Cater's stories are, extremely moving and and profound so the the singing stone, stone story is one of those amazing stories from him so i hope everybody will go and claim that gift and you can find that by just scrolling down a little bit below this video and you will see the link there to sign up for the newsletter and also be entered into that drawing for the free divination session well, Cater, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, as always. Thank you so much for the wisdom that you are bringing into our event here. It's truly, truly deeply appreciated. It's been my honor, my honor. And uh, again, my prayers go out to all of you during this time. And um, be safe and keep your elders safe and uh, ask those important questions. Because there is something that we each came into this world to offer that's really important. And, uh, and I think this, these are times where it, it's really asking us to, to think about that. What is that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Cater. I hope you have a beautiful day. All right, bye-bye.